Welcome to the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. I'm Joby Taylor. Uh, I work at the Shriver Center on campus directing the Shriver Peaceworker Program. And I'm here with my colleagues, Jennifer Robinson and Oscar Sinclair. And today we're happy to um, have a conversation about the Peace Corps. Um, this year we'll celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Peace Corps and we are all returned Peace Corps volunteers and in a minute we're going to um, have a chance to talk about our experiences and uh, it's really been a remarkably sustained and successful program um, and it's really uh, about the experiences of these people that have gone abroad so uh, this is a great chance to, to uh, talk a little bit about that so I wanted to just ask you um, first uh, to tell me a little bit about how how did you come to join the Peace Corps yeah. well I came to it a little bit later than some people I know some people have thought about it since high school but really I was finishing my undergrad education in education and I studied to be a reading teacher. Mm -hmm. So I was exposed to service learning, which is where you combine academic learning with service opportunities. Mm -hmm. And as I thought about what I wanted to do next, I wanted to really have an opportunity to teach in that setting, in that service learning type of environment. So to me, Peace Corps really represented an opportunity to teach and learn at the same time. So that's what made me pursue it. Yeah. Oscar, how about you? How'd you decide to join? Well, I think that's always a complicated question because sure. for everybody that's in Peace Corps, there are a couple dozen reasons why they join. But for me, I really grew up in a family in a situation where we were always hearing about sort of the lore of that of those early days, both of the Peace Corps and American society in general in the '60s. So my heroes growing up were, you know, the Kennedys, Martin Luther King, uh -huh. Sergeant Shriver. Mm -hmm. So. By the time I was thinking about what I wanted to do after college, that seemed like a very obvious choice. Uh -huh. um, I had also done a lot of work in college um, in African studies. So for me, it was a way to, to really put what I had been studying into practice as well as sort of continuing this, this long tradition. Yeah. It was a long application process. Yeah. It took oh, about a year. Right. Oh, yes. About a year. Oh, yeah. yeah. I actually... Um, met Mr. Shriver one time and mentioned the application and he said, oh, oh yeah, sorry about that. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a notoriously long right. application and uh, we kind of kid each other that uh, um, the length of time, they're trying to weed out people that uh, mm -hmm. might make other choices along the way. But. Oh, I, I think they absolutely do. I mean, if you can get through the application process, you really, really want to go. Yeah, and, uh, you're on your that way. helps. So um, where'd you go, Oscar? I was in Lesotho. I was in Southern Africa. Um, it's spelled Lesotho, but it's actually pronounced uh -huh. Lesotho. You heard it here. Um, yeah, yeah. My <laughs> my recruiter actually corrected me because um, uh -huh. they call you and they say, "Well, we've got an invitation. Um, we just want to check that you know the country that you're going to, and and have you accepted over the phone." Um, and I said, "Well, yes, of course. I'd love to go to Lesotho." And she paused for a second and said, "Well." Before you commit to that, you should learn how to pronounce the name <laughs> of the country you're going to. Sure. Um, but yeah, it's a very small country. It's about the size of Maryland. It's in a mountain range completely surrounded by South Africa. Uh -huh. um, wonderful, wonderful place. It's completely contained inside South Africa. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Fascinating. Jennifer, where'd you serve? I served in the Republic of Moldova, which is a really tiny wow. country, also about the size of Maryland. Mm -hmm. And I served in the mid-90s. So that was a time when Eastern Europe was really kind of an appealing place to travel and to, to explore. So I asked for Eastern Europe, thinking maybe Prague, thinking somewhere kind of romantic like that. And they called and said, how about Moldova? So I said, well, let me get a map out. <laughs> let me figure out where that is and um, quickly said yes, uh, even though I didn't quite know what I was getting into, but Moldova right. was the, the far west, um, s the furthest west Soviet Republic um, and had been independent just for a few years when I served there. So it was really transitioning from being part of the Soviet mm -hmm. Union to being an independent country. So it was a really interesting time to be there. I was part of just the third group to go into country and oh, wow. so we were still figuring a lot out about how to make it work there, but it was a great opportunity. You know, I was, a, I was a volunteer in Gabon, uh, Central Africa, in the early 90s, 1991, uh, 2, and 3. And I remember when uh, Peace Corps mm -hmm. opened up its first programs in mm -hmm. Eastern Europe, and it, it was a real buzz mm -hmm. um, uh, because, you know, all these um, new emerging uh, countries, Absolutely. and you had uh, Americans who were um, 
you know, working uh, as educators That's or right. small business consultants. So it was a really interesting time. Yeah, there was a real need to have native speakers of English because most of the schools, they, they'd never met a native English speaker. So it was a really great opportunity mm -hmm. to go and be part of a community. I taught English in the village school and was part of the group of teachers. So it was a great opportunity to use that. Oh, that's there. great. Yeah, um, I had a similar experience when um, I got my letter and it said, you know, that uh, I'd been invited to serve in Gabong and I scrambled mm -hmm. to get a map and figure out mm -hmm. where that was. And, um, you know, one early connection I made was uh, um, I realized that uh, Dr. Albert Schweitzer, who I'd mm -hmm. spent some time studying in uh, my religious studies background and philosophy, um, had spent over 50 years in, in Gabon. It was called French mm -hmm. Equatorial Africa at the time. But um, so, uh, you know, I was really excited once I <laughs> figured out where it was. Where it was. Right, um, right. But uh, also, uh, you know, you, you know, it raises this whole question about how do you even prepare for something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so it, as it turned out, and um, Gabon was is largely um, tropical forest. It's one of the, um, you know, one of the last really almost untouched mm -hmm. um, stretches of uh, tropical rainforest left. And it really was that there's a, you know, some small strip villages kind of carved out among the forest, but it was really kind of a, 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 a real experience of being in the outback for, you know, about two and a half years, so. Mm -hmm. did, did you speak French before you went to? Well, that's a great question. I had studied, um, you know, I had a couple of years of high school French, which I, I didn't take near as, I instantly wished I'd taken more seriously than I had. <laughs> and uh, during the uh, application process, I started working on it a bit, yeah. How about you, yeah. local languages? Sasutu is not really taught that much in uh, <laughs> American high schools. Uh, no, I. Yeah. Uh, Sasutu is the the big language in Lesotho, and um, it was probably one of the harder parts of training, trying uh -huh. to learn. Um, but I, I eventually, I got the hang of it. Uh -huh. um, one of my neighbors was about eighty five years old, very very old guy. Um, but when I moved into my village, he would come to my house. Uh, every every afternoon after I got out from work, he'd come over and knock on my door, and I'd have him in, and we'd sit and have tea, and and he would just talk, and I had absolutely no idea what he was saying, right. um, and he didn't speak a word of English. Uh, we just sort of drank tea and laughed at the uh -huh. complete incomprehensibility of anything either of us were saying, um, but I eventually. Yeah, I realized that, um, you know the language background that other volunteers brought mm -hmm. to these this experience uh, it certainly made a, a difference in terms of how deeply you could you know understand what was going on and how much you could get in but it tended to not be the thing that made or broke whether yeah. someone was able to stay and be successful because even mm -hmm, people right. that hadn't had much language background if they had the right kind of can do mm -hmm. and spirit yeah. and flexibility and curiosity um, it usually worked out, even though they were always misunderstanding <laughs> what was being said. It was interesting because language in Moldova was a real political issue. Because it was newly mm -hmm. independent, they had Peace Corps volunteers learn Romanian. And I had a French background, so that worked out fairly well. But at the same time, it made such an impact on the people that we worked with that we, we had learned Romanian rather than Russian, which was seen as sort of the language of the Soviet Union. And Romanian was really seen as the language of the new uh -huh. emerging country. And so we really saw the impact. And people were so pleased if we even tried. As you said, it, you know, it didn't determine how successful you were because people generally were so pleased that you were making an effort. And mm -hmm. we were taught by people who spoke beautiful Romanian and then we went to our villages and everybody got to learn their local dialect so it was uh -huh. a really fun process of coming from mm -hmm. this kind of proper language environment and then going into the village and figuring out you know mm -hmm. how, how you were really going to talk on a daily basis and how you would communicate in that that setting. Wow. Well I think all of us <clears throat> um, whether it was the n newly uh, kind of uh, independent countries mm -hmm. in Eastern Europe or kind of uh, post-colonial African countries mm -hmm. Um, language and culture as it had related mm -hmm. to these really deep histories was r a real part of what we uh, were immersed mm -hmm. in and learning and certainly f French was you know hardly the uh, indigenous language of Gabon mm -hmm. right. but there were like 60 languages right. in a place you know the size of maybe the state of Virginia or something mm -hmm. so uh, but 
it made a big difference to learn a little bit of Michogo. Mm -hmm. It would go a long way towards settling in, yeah, being accepted. Well, um, tell me a little bit about the projects that you worked on. Um, Peace Corps is not exactly a development agency. It's mm -hmm. it's really has mixed goals of cross cultural goals and um, but definitely a service agency that wants to accomplish some projects. So, tell me a little bit about what you worked on, sure. Jennifer. Well, I, I taught English in the local school, which was a great kind of way to get into the community and be part of a team of teachers and, you know, kind of experience what they experienced as, as part of that group. So I didn't feel really set apart, which was great. It made it easier to become part of the community. So I spent my day, most of my mornings, I, I taught everything from third grade English through 11th grade English, and I'd have one hour classes. Mm -hmm. and. Um, the students would rotate in and out, and uh, we were working on getting them ready for their exams, but also how to communicate and how to think critically, which was something that was kind of new in the curriculum. Um, so as a teacher, a lot of my work was figuring out how to adapt to the Moldovan setting and how to work within a classroom environment and bring in some things that I felt were meaningful to me, but at the uh -huh. same time, you know, we're, we're going to work for the students as well and help them benefit. And then on my secondary projects, we did some English clubs and, and worked with the teachers who wanted to learn a little English. But we also did a big project in my second year where we wrote a grant to get the heating system of the school fixed mm -hmm. because heating um, in Moldova was fairly scarce. Um, you know, they, they had regular power outages and the school's heating system had been in disrepair. So I worked with the community to just facilitate a grant writing process to receive funds. Mm -hmm. um, a small amount of money goes a long way. So we were able to, re to repair the school's heating system and leave that as kind of a legacy over time. Um, and, and they used their grant writing skills then to be able to write for other grants in the future. Uh -huh. So that was a really rewarding project. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Oscar, what was your main project? Well, in Lesotho, all the projects are related to the HIV-AIDS epidemic. Mm -hmm. uh, officially, the um, prevalence rate is about 23%. Unofficially, it's mm -hmm. considerably higher than that. Um, so all the work that Peace Corps does in Lesotho is related in some way uh, to that issue. So I was actually placed as sort of an experiment with a large um, development group Catholic Relief Services mm -hmm. in a very, very small village uh, up in the mountains. And they were doing a very broad, very large-scale development project. Everything from getting uniforms to orphans and vulnerable children in the schools to uh, building gardens for um, food security issues. So I really worked as sort of a technical advisor within that group, uh, doing everything from going out into the field and helping when they needed a spare hand with one of their projects to um, uh, helping fix their computers when the dust <laughs> got mm -hmm. in them. Um, so that, I mean, that, that had mixed success. That, that wasn't exactly what I had expected to be doing in Peace Corps, and it's not what many Peace Corps volunteers do. Mm -hmm. So in addition to that, I did a lot of work with other Peace Corps volunteers, traveling to their site and being sort of a, um, a roving... Uh, Educator, you could say. I, I worked with a lot of mm -hmm. high schoolers on HIV AIDS issues. Uh, in Lesotho, there's a lot of um, taboos around what you can talk about uh, mm -hmm. as regards to HIV. Um, but if you're American, you're, you're sort of already the crazy American. So you can go into a, a classroom and, and say, you know, ask me questions. And, uh -huh. uh, you have a little license to... Yeah, and the, and the teachers really understand that, and the parents really understand that. Mm -hmm. um, so it works out well. That's an interesting... Um, that just raises an interesting point about, you know, kind of the role of outsider mm -hmm. folks in, in working on these kind of projects, because we... Yeah. I mean, if we uh, continued... Uh, we could speak about this for a long time, but how complicated these kind of development <coughs> projects are. Um, it sounds like there was some of that going on. Yeah, I... There's always a lot of tension about that because there's a lot of history, especially in Africa, as, as you know, mm -hmm. about the the Westerners coming in and saying, well, you know, that's not working, guys. Let's do this instead. Um, so we really wanted to avoid that. Um, uh -huh. But at the same time, I mean, the, the scale of the, the problem there is so big that uh, you just find yourself doing whatever you can and, yeah. and hope that you don't don't cause more problems than you're mm -hmm. solving. Yeah. Now I had um, I had studied philosophy and religion in my undergraduate, and I thought I, my resume was a classic uh, 
English teacher <laughs> uh, resume, and so I was fully, you know, braced it. That would, you know, I kind of assumed that would be my position, and um, I don't even think I realized that somewhere in my resume I'd put that I worked for my father's construction company every summer, and <laughs> my Peace Corps recruiter flagged that and pulled it out, and um, so it, it, I ended up being a construction volunteer, um, which my dad got a big kick out of because he <laughs> told me, what do you know about building? <laughs> but um, so it was a great project. Um, I built elementary schools and teachers' houses in uh, rural areas. Um, but again, you know, it's a really uh, it's a very successful project on one level that there was some funding from the local government mm -hmm. to invest in elementary schools in the interior of the country, which was really um, a need. Um, so on the kind of macro level, the idea really was um, to create some infrastructure in the interior so that every, you know, there was this real urbanization mm -hmm. movement. There are, you know, many countries um, in that area where there's just a single capital city, a single mm -hmm. city really, and uh, it just can't support the influx of people that are kind of pouring mm -hmm. in there and leaving the, the rural areas. So the idea was to cr create, you know, build some nice schools in the in the uh, rural areas and see if families would stay at least for those primary school years. Mm. Um, it worked really well, but of course, you know, the give and take was they were still largely using the French curriculum and the mm -hmm. French um, standard tests, and so it still felt like it was steeped in, um, you know, uh, the, the whole identity of Gabon was still very much in formation and, um, you know, you the questions about whether there could be local language instruction mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. So you're building, you know, you're, you know, you're seeing these, literally, buildings rise up out of the ground, and you're part of something mm -hmm. concrete. Um, but you know, it's it's always complicated. Mm -hmm. But um, it was a great, great project uh, in in that respect. That you know, I kind of laid my plans out on the table in the morning and laid mm -hmm. bricks most of the day. Um, so it was a lot of physical physical mm -hmm. labor. Well, um, what else? What else uh, that, uh, you know, kind of when you think about your Peace Corps experience, what other memories or, um, you know, lessons or kind of takeaways do you come to mind? Um, it really is a two and a half year kind of immersion mm -hmm. stint that's filled, I know for myself, with many stories and um, kind of rich experiences. So anything else come to mind? For me, a lot of it is the opportunity just to spend time with people. And in Moldova, there's a great culture of having large meals mm -hmm. and using any opportunity to kind of celebrate and be together. And when I think back to my time there, it's really those times around the table where you really got to connect to people and kind of hear people's stories and get to know them, let them get to know you. I remember being at somebody's home and they said, that they couldn't believe that somebody who represented a country that was formerly Moldova's greatest enemy when it was part of the Soviet Union was sitting at their table in the village of Lubushna oh, right. in Moldova and having mm -hmm. a meal with them. And, you know, that, that idea that in such a short amount of time you could really bridge something and, and just connect to people as people. When I left, I think what I taught in my English classroom meant something to people, but I think a lot more of it was what I learned from people and what I sort of demonstrated just by how I chose to live, um, you know, I felt like that was a, a bigger impact probably than what I, I taught was just choosing, you know, how to get to know people and mm -hmm. what you take from the culture and, you know, making the effort to learn the language. So I, I think about those meals, which is also where I really, you know, got my language skills to be better mm -hmm. was by mm -hmm. talking to people and um, getting to know them that way. Well, I, I hadn't really, uh, until you put it that way, I hadn't really thought of that context mm -hmm. of so recently after the Soviet mm -hmm. Union had uh, yeah. uh, broken up that um, there really was a, yeah. that bridging happened very quickly. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Very, very quickly. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Mm, boy. Um, I mean, I, I would second everything yeah. Jen just said. Like My best memories of Peace Corps are just sitting at the clinic with a friend of mine talking about growing up in... Um, mm -hmm in upstate New York and growing up in rural Lesotho mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, having farmers in one family and farmers in the other family. But um, w one thing that I would add is the, I loved being a Peace Corps volunteer. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the experience of actually being a Peace Corps volunteer and being a part of Peace Corps is really something that um, you don't forget easily. Mm -hmm. 
the, the camaraderie among volunteers is, uh, is very tight uh -huh. um, and amazing. Because, I mean, you're in a place where, you know, you're, you're meeting all these people that are very different from you in the villages, but also the people that you're in Peace Corps with are all coming from mm -hmm. very, very different places. Mm -hmm. um, and that I didn't expect. You know, I expected, you know, just out of college, fairly liberal, mm -hmm. um, upper middle class. But in reality, there was enormous variety within the volunteers. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And uh, some of those volunteers are the best friends I've ever had. Mm -hmm. um, so now, I, I guess we'll touch on this later, but I came home in May and I find myself uh, a grad student at the Shriver program, yeah. surrounded again by mm -hmm. returned Peace Corps volunteers. And that sense of camaraderie and being a part of something mm -hmm. uh, has really continued. Yeah, it really is a uh, rich experience. I've kind of, the more I, I think about it over time now, um, I, I kind of think about it as having these kind of dual um, roles where and sometimes it was a, it was a window into this world that I had no, you know, in, in the, the village of Seca Seca. I had, it was completely, utterly strange to me. Mm -hmm. So a window into a place that uh, I never would have guessed that I could really be immersed in mm -hmm. and become part of a, the community. Um, but in other ways, it's a mirror. It's so mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. that it's this really extended reflection on, like, you know, what's it mean to be mm -hmm. an American here? Mm -hmm. What's it mean to be, you know, who I am? Period, and in that way, whether it was Lesotho or Moldova or Gabon, there's that kind of uh, thread that connects mm -hmm. it, which was like all the stuff you kind of learned about yourself mm -hmm. kind of along the way. Or um, mm -hmm. I was thinking about, um, you know, uh, you talk about meals, and mm -hmm. there's any time a group of uh, Peace Corps volunteers get together, there's always <laughs> food, food stories. Mm -hmm. And, you know, on the one hand, they're kind of, they're usually stories of eating you know, things that are <laughs> off the menu uh, uh, here at home. Shall we say. Um, yeah, but uh, on the other, we all realized how important, like any gesture mm -hmm. um, that was basically saying, I'm, I'm here mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I'm going to eat what yeah. is on the local, you know, menu. And um, I'm just, you know, tell me, tell me how to be and I'm, I'm open to mm -hmm. trying to be. Um, so I knew going, when I was uh, posted in uh, this village of Seca Seca, I'd, I knew that, uh, uh, one of the local delicacies were these uh, grub worms. And when I was posted in the village, it, it, it was not the season of the year, mm -hmm. so I kind of got a, a, a pass for a little while, but I knew it was coming. And uh, I had a, you know, a young uh, boy that was kind of became my real sidekick, uh, Jean-Francois, and he would tell me, like, the season's coming, you know, we're going to go grub worm hunting. And, um, you know, this it, kind of intergenerational uh, bond, he was so happy to to take me into the you know forest when it was time and they'd fell these uh, a palm tree and um, the grubs would you know kind of eat away at the inside of the it, really it's just palm hearts they're just eating mm -hmm. hearts of palm you know they never touch the ground and you know you'd listen you'd put your ear down to it each day as they walk the paths and it would get louder and louder and you'd put your ear in and you'd hear them and then they would just, you know, they knew when it was time, when it was time to harvest and you'd kind of split the trunk open and, and gather these uh, grubs. And um, so he and I had gone looking, but uh, it was his uh, father then that came, you know, came very formally to my house and you know, it was like, Mr. Mr. Joby, you'll be eating with us this evening, you know. And I thought, okay, brace, brace yourself, here we go. And, you know, it came down to his uh, home and um, here's this, you know, plate of grub worms and some other, some manioc and some other dishes and, um, you know, it was just a quiet kind of simple meal. But I had, I had uh, geared myself up thinking, you know, this is one you don't go into cautiously. You just jump right. in and, you know, pop a few grub worms <laughs> and, and uh, you know, get on with it. Just maybe uh, ask you to share a little bit about your experience of coming home and, and uh, coming to Baltimore and coming to UMBC. Oh my! I guess. Uh -huh. <laughs> <gonna fight> over. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Ask you, you're fresh. You're yeah. just months in. Yeah. Well, and, and like you said, I came home in uh, in May, um, and I'm a, a grad student with the Shriver Public Policy Program. Um, and part of the Shriver Program is uh, a service placement mm -hmm. that you do in return for your stipend. Um, sh so I, I should say this is really important for the audience that in addition to being the two people I'm sitting here talking with. 
Uh, Joby and Jennifer are also my two bosses. <laughs> um, so, right. uh, but it's it's really a joy to come back and really be part of a program that sort of takes what you did in Peace Corps and then really uses that not as the end, but as a jumping off point mm -hmm. to, to what you'll do with the next 20, 40, 60 years of your life. Mm -hmm. This program really stood out to me. I came home from Moldova, which is a, generally a cold country, and spent mm -hmm. some time in Florida <laughs> and, and readjusted and had all the typical uh -huh. readjustment things of, you know, going to the grocery store and feeling overwhelmed, which, you know, you, by yeah. the choices and, yeah, the produce um, aisle. Wow. you know, not being able to order off a menu because it's hard to make a choice and those sorts of things. But I was really focused on what my next step would be and how I could translate that Peace Corps experience into something that would be meaningful. And so I came to visit the program, the Peace Worker program as well, and really thought that this was an opportunity, as Oscar said, to really take this and kind of make it something that was sustainable for the rest of my life, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And Baltimore was a place where I could do that and become part of a community of returned Peace Corps volunteers, but also part of a larger community. And Baltimore is a pretty open place, I think, and pretty accepting. So I came back and I was working with the middle school dropout prevention program through mm -hmm. the Shriver Center as well. And I found, you know, being in classrooms in Moldova and then coming and being in middle school classrooms here, you know, I, I could see, you know, things that I was learning, um, you know, here as well as I was working on evaluation for the program. And it was just great to kind of transition and to continue my experience in schools as I studied public policy as well. Um, and to, to do that service learning and have that reflection component continue yeah. and have the academic piece fit with what I was doing. So um, I just came and hoped that Baltimore would be a place where I could stay, and it really has turned out to be yeah. that. Absolutely. Well, we've got um, a number of events that we're going to celebrate uh, across mm -hmm. the 50th anniversary. We have a, an exhibit up in our uh, UMBC library currently of mm -hmm. featuring um, artifacts and photos mm -hmm. from our staff and grad students who have served uh, around the world. Um, we'll have a couple of uh, events later this mm -hmm. fall celebrating um, a number of returned Peace Corps volunteers mm -hmm. who have become deeply engaged in working in Baltimore City. Mm -hmm. And we're going to host a conversation about social change work, um, kind of bringing the world home. And then into the spring, we're also planning to host a, uh, a night of storytelling at one of the theaters in the mm -hmm. city, the Creative Alliance. So. Um, Thank you for being here and uh, for this conversation. I know I enjoyed it. And um, we'll say goodbye for now, but uh, thanks for joining our conversation. Uh -huh.